God has called us to be lights to this world. How do we live in such a way where we show forth the glory of who God is? Open with us to 1 Timothy chapter 4 as we consider how we become good examples of our faith to this world. Amen. Good morning. Hey, while you're standing, would you take out your Bibles and open them with me to the book of 1 Timothy? If you don't have a Bible, you can raise your hand and one of our ushers will bring you one. 1 Timothy is right near the end of your Bible. Open to the last book, Revelation, and turn to the left. You'll find 1 Timothy. We are in 1 Timothy chapter 4. About halfway through the chapter today, we're going to pick it up at verse 9. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. There the Apostle Paul writes, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. These things command and teach. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believer in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Father, I ask as we stand here with our, our Bibles open that you would, by your Spirit, open our, our hearts, our minds, our ears to hear from you, to receive from you your Word. Lord, we believe that your Word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We believe that it is useful for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that we would be ready for every good work this week. We pray, God, that our time spent here today would be, uh, Lord, that it would be profitable and good to the growth of our, our lives into more and more character like you. Lord, work in us, we pray. Make us more like you, Jesus, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name, and all those that agreed said, amen. amen. You can be seated. Always about... 10 or 11 years old when a new kid moved into the neighborhood, and when he moved into the neighborhood, there was instantly a disturbance in the force. <laughs> there were not a lot of kids in the neighborhood that I grew up in, the neighborhood my parents still live in, but those that were there, there were a few of them that were right around my age. And I was pretty good friends with a couple of the kids who lived across the street from my parents, but then this new kid moved into the neighborhood, and when he did, although I was not a, I was not a small kind of runt of the litter kind of kid, I, I was a pretty big, tall kid, and, but when he moved in, I was instantly like the fourth man out. And I found that uh, he was, well, he was a bit of a bully. And I remember very clearly one day my older brother, Alan, he's eight years older than me, he was watching this whole thing take place, and clearly Alan did not like what he saw. So Alan did what Alan did. He came and grabbed me, pulled me aside, and said, you don't let that guy push you around. You're bigger than him, and I'm going to teach you how to fight. And so for the next 20 or 30 minutes, he gave me a talking to about, you don't let people push you around, and that's just the way Alan is. And then it was... I'm pretty sure that very same night, very late that night, about two in the morning, that my older brother Alan came in and woke me up. Miles, Miles, wake up. Yeah, what, what? You remember that stuff I told you about fighting this morning? Yeah? Forget all of it. <laughs> Get up, I need you to come in the bathroom and help me. So he drug me into the bathroom to hold a flashlight on his face that was bloodied and bruised as he stitched his own eye up. I'm not kidding, with a needle and a thread. And he went on telling me about how, don't get in fights. Forgot all the stuff that I told you this morning. Now, seeing his bruised and bloodied face, I can't imagine what the other guy looked like. Um, I can guarantee he was not sewing his own eye up like Alan did. That was just the way that Alan is and was. It's really, really important to have good examples in life. 
Now, I will leave it up to you to determine whether or not Alan was a good example in that situation, but it is good to have good examples in life. Timothy was left by Paul in the great city of Ephesus to pastor a church that was off course. He was given the task by the Apostle Paul to help that church get back on course, and it was clearly not going to be an easy task. It was a task that was easily stated, but hard to accomplish. And so he's called upon to write the course, to get them back to where they need to be. And among all the hardships that Timothy would face in doing that, and there were many things that were standing before him that would be challenging, among those challenges, one of the significant challenges for Timothy was his youth. Now, when we think of youth, we instantly think of someone who is in junior high or high school in the youth ministry, maybe 13 to 18 years old. Timothy was well beyond that. At the time that he was called upon to lead and pastor this church, he was probably in his late 20s, early 30s, 28 to 32 years old. When he first met the Apostle Paul, he was a teenager, but he has now been with the Apostle Paul for you know, about 14 years that Paul has poured into him. But in the culture that he was going to be ministering in first century Asia Minor, to be in his young 30s would be a hindrance to him. It would be difficult for him to be able to fulfill that task. That would be a significant challenge for him as age was a very important factor in leadership in that culture. And so he's got this standing before him been thinking a lot about this this last week because I, I remember being young, and, and I realize <laughs> that for many of you, you go, wait, you're still quite young. And yeah, I agree, but I'm, I'm, I'm not quite as young as I was when I first started out in serving in ministry. And I, you know, it became rather clear just about eight months ago, I was sitting down talking with my good friend, Pastor David Guzik, and we were talking about young pastors in the ministry. And he, at one point, he casually looked over to me and goes, you do realize you're not one of those young pastors anymore. <laughs> and I looked at him and went, what, what, what are you talking about? And uh, many of you know that I teach at the Bible College in Marietta Calvary Chapel Bible College. And this last semester, the fall semester, was the first semester where it hit me as I was standing there looking at all these students that were there, especially the first semester, that technically I'm old enough to be the dad for those that are in their first semester. It was like, that was shocking to me. Shocking enough for me to think about it for the entire rest of the day. <laughs> and so... I, I, I remember, you know, when I first began pastoring the church at 28, I, I remember that this passage of scripture especially was often on my mind. And, and even before that, when I first started teaching the Bible, when I first started uh, leading a youth ministry at 19, this passage of scripture, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12 specifically, was something that I often went back to and thought a lot about. I remember when I first did the very first funeral that I did. I was 21 years old, and, and stepping into that, there's a lot of nerves and anxiety when you step in, especially the circumstances of that one. It was a, a couple that had delivered a stillborn baby, and, and you step into that, and you know, one of the questions that people ask, especially when you're just starting out, you do your first wedding, you do your first funeral, and people go, so you've done a lot of these? You go, um, Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you don't want people to go, what do you mean this is your first time, <laughs> you know? And so I would find myself coming back to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. And I, I still find that I, I think on these quite a bit today as well. And even though you may never be in a position to lead or pastor some group of people within the church, and even though you may not count yourself as youth or young, these words still have great application for us, no matter your age, no matter the stage of life that you are in. God wants to speak to us here in this passage. Paul says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. And so these words are worthy of our trust. They're worthy of our acceptance. They are worthy of our consideration, our application, whether we are early in our walk or we've been walking with the Lord for a long time. The exhortations in this passage are important. Now, Timothy, when you think about this man, he had a wonderful example for him in the work of the ministry. Pastor Paul was Timothy's pastor. It was through the, the church planting and pastoring endeavors of the Apostle Paul that Timothy 
and his mother and grandmother became Christians. And then when he was somewhere between 14 and 18 years old, the Apostle Paul came back to his church, this church that Timothy had grown up in, and he said, listen, I, I want you to come with me. I, you're useful in the ministry. And so for the next you know, decade and a half, Timothy traveled with Paul all around the known world, and he was able to observe Paul's pattern of life and the way that he planted churches, the way that he pastored people, the way that he wrote, the way that he preached. And so that was Timothy's example. But now Timothy is left there in the city of Ephesus to pastor, to lead, to be up front before all these people. And now he is called upon to be the example. And again, though you may not consider yourself to be in the same kind of situation as young Pastor Timothy was, and though you may not consider yourself to be a leader or an example to other people, we need to understand, point number one is very true, you are an example to someone at every stage of your faith. Whether you like that truth or not, it's a reality. If you're a follower of Jesus today, you are an example to someone at every stage of your faith. People are watching you. People are taking close notice of who you are and how you live. Maybe friends, family members, neighbors, coworkers, especially a spouse, your children, they're watching to see what does it really mean to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus, to be a disciple. People are watching. And they, they keep tabs on us, especially if you have a cross-connection church sticker on the back of your car or a license plate cover around it, or if your neighbors see that you get up early on a Sunday morning and you're dressed ready to go and they're looking at you going, what in the world are you doing on a Sunday morning? Don't you know this is time to sleep in? And so people notice that you go to church. People notice if you carry a Bible or if you read that Bible. They take notice of these things and people are watching and we are an example to people in our faith. Which is why Paul reminds Timothy and us in verse 10, 1 Timothy 4.10, For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, for to this end we both labor and suffer reproach. We are working towards this end. If you trust in the living God, if he is your savior, you have put your faith in Christ Jesus, as I do then you and I need to labor in the exercise of godliness, is what Paul says. And we need to labor in the exercise of godliness because people are watching to see how this Christian Jesus follower disciple thing actually works out. That's why Paul would say to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, work out your salvation. By grace through faith, God has saved us, given us a new heart, made us new creations, and that which he has done internally, we need to work that out so that people will see, so that they can see the transformation that has taken place. This is one of the reasons Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, he would say, you are the salt of the earth. Matthew 5 verse 13, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Because we trust in the living God, because he is our Savior, we must labor, work, Sometimes struggle and strive in this work to work out this salvation so that that internal becomes external, that which is hidden becomes seen, so that people would see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven, that we would be a light to the world. Light is important. Light is powerful. In fact, light is powerful. A couple of years ago, my dad and I made a frivolous purchase in a uh, crowdfunding campaign. I saw this thing online and I was enamored with this laser cutter. I had laser envy. And, and so I showed it to my dad and my dad said, we should buy that. And I said, you're right, we should buy that. So we plopped down the $2,500 to buy it. It just came this last week. I've been cutting things with lasers all week long. It's awesome. But it reminds me how powerful light is. No, we don't need it, but it, it is cool. 
It's a reminder how powerful light is and how important. Jesus wants us to shine brightly. This world is in darkness, and the world needs to see the goodness of our God and his power, his ability to transform us, and it's seen in our lives. We are the canvas. Uh Uh-oh. We are the canvas on which God desires to show forth his glory. And so 1 Timothy 4.11, he says, These things command and teach. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Let no one despise your youth, he says. The New International Version translates it, Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. Now, again, you may not consider yourself to be like Timothy in this situation. You may, not say, you may say, well, I'm not, I'm not exactly young. I'm not exactly youth. I'm not in that place of leadership. But we do recognize that we're an example to someone at every stage of our faith, however we're walking. So people are watching us. But you say, well, I'm not youth. And in context, again, Timothy was in a difficult situation. That was a challenge he was facing. He was in a culture where age was highly exalted as an important factor in being a leader And he was younger than maybe many of the people that were a part of the church there at Ephesus. And so he's going to have to work to be an example to the people there in that context and to that community. One commentator on this passage said, give no one any ground by any fault of character for despising your youth. And and I might change it. I might adjust it a little bit for us today. And I might say, give no one any ground by any fault of character to despise or disdain your faith. Not just your youth, but your faith. How is our life instructing others about Christ and our faith in Jesus Christ? We should give no one any grounds upon which they might be able to disdain or despise the faith. Point number two on your outline. Endeavor to live an irreproachable life that will be worthy of imitation. We should give the best effort to live our lives in such a way that no one has any opportunity to criticize the church, to criticize Christ, to criticize Christians. We should avoid the possibility to justify any person's criticism, says the Believer's Bible commentary on this passage. And that's not necessarily easy to do, but it's something we need to be aware of, especially that we're living in a culture here in 21st century America that is increasingly becoming hostile towards people of faith. Now, it may be a small minority, but it's a very vocal minority that is very hostile towards the church and towards Christianity. And so we should endeavor to live in such a way that exalts the glory of Christ. Sadly, there have been many times that Christians in churches have negatively affected people's perception of who God is and how he works. Christian history, church history, is not the best as it comes to being exemplary. But we should endeavor to live irreproachable lives that are worthy of imitation. And so he says, but be an example to the believers. Not only should we live in such a way that is beyond reproach or criticism, but we should work to be good examples. Good examples both to believers, to others who are in the church, and good examples of believers. Because there's difference in in translation of this passage. The King James Version says, be an example of the believer. The New King James and many other English translations say, be an example to the believer. So there's discussion among translators. Should it be be an example of those who are followers of God to a world that does not follow God? Or is it be an example to believers who are followers of God? And I would say both are equally good and important. We should endeavor to be an example in our lives to other Christians, but also to people who are not yet Christians, that they would see the way that we live. I love the Apostle Paul's word to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, and it is a word that is both an encouragement but at the same time a challenge because Paul says there, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. And I, I long to be able to say that with total sincerity, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And I, I think in some ways I'd feel no problem saying, imitate me as I imitate Christ. But I'm, I'm just as much as a sinner as any other person. And Paul was too. I don't think that he's being pompous or arrogant in any way in saying, imitate me as I imitate Christ. But Paul was endeavoring to be an imitator of God as a dear child. And he could say to other people, you can follow my example. 
What a great blessing to be able to say that with sincerity. You can follow my example. And we should endeavor to live our lives in such a way that we can say to those who are Christians and to those who are not yet Christians, this is what it looks like to be a man or a woman of faith seeking to follow Christ. And so Paul exhorts Timothy to be a good example here. And he exhorts him to be a a good example in six areas, in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. First, in word. Let no one despise your faith, but be an example of and to believers in word. Now, there are at least two ways to interpret this exhortation. One is to interpret it, be an example to Christians and non-Christians alike in your speech and the way that you speak. And that is a perfectly valid way to interpret this passage. And it goes right in line with Paul's exhortation in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. I love the way the New Living Translation renders that. It says, do not use foul or abusive language. It's very simple. As a Christian, As a follower of Jesus, to be an example to people who are also followers of Jesus and to be an example to people who are not yet followers of Jesus, we should not be those who use foul language or abusive language. He says, do not use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear you. And so we should be an example in our speech, but also we should be an example in our knowledge and our use of the word, the word of God. Be an example to the believer in word, in your knowledge and your use of the word. The way we use our words, our speech, and the way we use the word of God is very, very important. You know, you probably remember as a kid that old saying, Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, I've long since forgotten the sticks and stones that hurt me, and I still remember some words from when I was a kid that were very painful. We all do. So we know that that is completely absurd. And so the way we use our words, we've got to be very careful with that. But the way we use the Word of God, also, we need to take note how we use it. Do we have a good knowledge of it? Do we exercise it, use it in the right way? Perhaps one of the greatest compliments, encouragements that I remember receiving, again, remembering words long after they were spoken. I was 23 years old and I was taking a class on biblical counseling. And as I was going through this class, the first hour and a half of the class was lecture for 20 weeks. And then the last hour of every class was spent in a small group discussion. We'd divide up into small groups and men's groups and women's groups. And so I was in a small group with about 12 guys. And we were about two-thirds of the way through this course. And one of the guys in the class, he was more than 20 years older than me, he said, you know, Miles, one of the things I really appreciate about you as a young man is that you always follow up whatever it is you have to say in this class with the Word of God. You always have some passage of Scripture that you are using to substantiate what you say. I still remember that to this day. It was a great encouragement. Now, that was not necessarily intentional. I didn't go into that class thinking, I'm going to have a Bible passage for everything I say. It was just that as I had spent time in the Scriptures, the Word of God was in me, and it just came out, and that should be the case for all of us, that we have a good knowledge of the Word of God and that we use it. We should be exemplary in how we use the, God, the Word of God. And, and so many of you here who I know are. It's such a blessing. I think of Mike Phillips. Mike Phillips, just about every time that I talk with him, he's always got scripture he wants to share with me. It's always an encouragement and a blessing to me. And, and we should be like that, endeavoring to know and use the Word of God. So he says, be an example to and of the believer in the Word, but also in conduct. In conduct. Now, this very same word that's translated conduct here in 1 Timothy chapter 4 is used by the Apostle Peter in his letter, 1 Peter Peter chapter 1. He says this But as he who is called you is holy, so also you be holy in all of your conduct. Now, if you've tried to be holy, you know that's a challenge. Be holy in all of your conduct, not just a little bit of your conduct on Sunday morning when other Christians are all around you. Be holy in all of your conduct at all times, knowing that people are always watching. And and I think that I, I need to qualify this exhortation by saying, it is clear and it is understood 
that none of us in this life, because of the continuance of our fallen carnal nature, our flesh, none of us will ever be able to be perfectly conducted in holiness here in this life. But we should have that as our aim. We might only hit it 5% of the time. But that should be the goal that we are seeking as he who has called us is holy to be holy in all of our conduct. And yes, we will fail. And we are grateful that if we fail, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is our intercessor, interceding on our behalf constantly, our mediator between God the Father and us. He brings us and gives us great forgiveness for our fallenness. And we will fall. But we should have it as our aim to be holy in our conduct. In the very same letter, 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter says this, Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners, pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, among people who are outside the church. Our conduct should be honorable. People who are not Christians should look up and say, that's a person who has honesty and integrity and self-control and humility. They should see that in me. They should see that in us. And we should be laboring towards that end. Even if we live in a culture that reproaches us because, oh, you guys are a bunch of fools. You actually think that God thing is true? Even if we live in a culture that reproaches us, they should see in us, well, but I see that they really do have honesty and integrity and self-control and mercy and grace and love. Point number three on our outlines. We aren't saved by our good conduct, but we're certainly saved for good conduct. It is not your good conduct that will make you a Christian but it is your good conduct that will show other people that you're a Christian. Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, he said, For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we're not saved by our good conduct, but we are saved for good conduct. And so Paul says, you should be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, third, in love. In the way that you love and how you love, you should be an example to believers and non-believers alike. Jesus said in John 13, 35, well, 34, he said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also should love one another for By this will all men know that you are my disciples by the love that you have one for another. Would to God that our culture would say, you know, we may not believe in God, we may not like that whole church thing, but those Christians, they love people. And let's be very honest about it. In the United States of America in the last 15, 20 years, the church in America has not been known by its love. It just hasn't. And that is unfortunate. And so we need to work to resolve that, that people would see in us the same kind of love that they see in Christ. Jesus says, as I have loved you, that you would love one another. How did he love us? Well, he laid down his life for us. In what ways are we laying down our lives for other people? Being sacrificial. Now, I I can go on and on all day long about how giving and sacrificial this church is, but we should always be striving to be more so. Because our God did not spare anything for us. And so be an example in word, in conduct, in love, forth in spirit. Now in verse 14, Paul will say say to Timothy, Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. The gift there is an indication of spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13 and 14 talk about spiritual gifts. God, when he saved you by grace through faith... He came into your life by His Holy Spirit, and when He came into your life by His Holy Spirit, if you're a Christian today, He gave you spiritual gifts. Did you know that? You have spiritual gifts. And so we should be those that are seeking to exercise those things, not neglect the gift. Uh, You know, we would assume that the gift that Timothy has here has something to do with pastoring and teaching, but there are many other gifts that God has given. And so we should be those that are exemplary in our use of the gifts that God has given to us, but not just the gifts of the Spirit. I think even more importantly, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, self-control, all of these things should be abundant and growing more so in our lives 
that that should be clear and evident in us that there is the fruit of the Spirit, that we are seeking to walk in the Spirit, not fulfilling the lusts of our fallen nature. We should be exemplary in our walk in the Spirit. And Paul continues, and he says, not just in word, not just in conduct, not just in faith or in love, not just in the Spirit, but you should be a conduct in faith. You and I must exercise ourselves in godliness so that we are exemplary in our faith, our trust in God and our faithfulness to God. It should be evident in our lives that the more we walk with Jesus, that we trust him more implicitly, more fully. We trust him with our finances. We trust him with our children. We trust him with our future. We trust him with everything that we have in this life. We trust him. But not only do we trust him, we are faithful to him in following him. We're faithful to him in obeying him. We're faithful to him in prayer and in the scriptures, in every aspect of our lives, that we are faithful to him. It should be exemplary for us. And then finally, he says, be an example to the believer in word and conduct and love and spirit and faith and finally in purity, in purity. Now, this word purity here, it's only used a couple times in the New Testament, but the, the idea, the concept of being pure is to be unmixed, unalloyed. There's no mixture here. And the purging, if you will, of all the dross. If you were to go and you found a great big chunk, a big old huge thing of gold, it would be filled with all kinds of impurities and it would have to be refined so that the impurities could be purged. And our lives are to be purged of impurities. What's that look like? Well, I think of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3. There Paul says, But fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for Christians. It's fitting for Christians that there not be any dross, any impurities inside of this life. Now, of course, when we come to Christ, we are filled with impurities, but through the sanctifying, cleansing process, God, by His grace, through His Word, by the work of His Spirit, and by us seeking to obey Him in godliness, He purges out these things, and He begins to transform us more and more into the likenesses of His kids. And so he, he says, all these things, they should not even be named, named among you as is fitting for the saints. He goes on in verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 5, and he says, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather of giving of thanks. Then in verse 6, therefore do not be partakers with them. Don't allow these things to be a part of your life. By God's grace, by our own working out of our salvation. Point number four, by God's grace, we should labor to be exemplary. How? I mean, it's great to say something like that, but how? How do we work that out? Well, what does Paul say? 1 Timothy 4, verse 13. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. How do we grow to be exemplary in word, in love, in spirit, in faith, in conduct? Well, I, I think that what Paul exhorts Timothy toward here in verses 13 through 15 is essential. It's important. Till I come, while I'm absent, if I'm not there, Timothy, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. That's what we do when we gather here together on a Sunday morning. We're giving attention to reading. We open the scriptures, we read from the scriptures, and from that passage of the scripture, we give exhortation and doctrine, instruction, teaching. We challenge you, I challenge you, I challenge myself as I study through these things through the week to grow in these areas. That's what we're doing. Now, there's a lot of different things that a church could do and do, do, churches do, but what we do is we open the scriptures, we read from the scriptures, we allow the scriptures to be that which informs our understanding of what is true and what is real and what is right, and we seek by God's grace, by his spirit, to work those things out, apply them. And so he says, if I'm not there or if I'm there, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Don't neglect that gift, Timothy. You were called to preach these things, to pastor these people. Don't neglect that gift, but meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to this. Don't just give yourself partly to this. It is not enough. 
to just have exhortation, reading, doctrine for 40 minutes on a Sunday. No, that doesn't mean we're going to start doing 90-minute services or 120 minutes. Don't worry. I'm saying you, with God, on your own, tomorrow and Tuesday, should be spending time reading the Word of God, allowing the teachings, the doctrine of the Scripture, to exhort you and your life, to challenge you by God's Spirit to walk in these things. Give yourself entirely to it so that your progress will be evident to all. People will begin to see the you that was you is no longer the you that is you. You can think about that. I'll have to think about that too because it just came out. So, <laughs> But hopefully that's what people begin to see is that you're different. In, in John, in one of his letters, 1 John, we'll be there sometime, I think this year, he says, those who you used to run with think it's strange you don't run with them anymore. That's wonderful. And, and may it be that there are some people who think it's strange because, you know, you're not the same person. And for better, for good, hopefully, right? And so he says, till I come, give attention to these things. Exemplary lives are the product of a careful and thoughtful acting out of the things that we attentively read and are exhorted to do from the doctrines of the Scriptures. And so he says, 1 Timothy 4.16, Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. The New Living Translation says, Keep a close watch on how you live. That's a good exhortation. Keep a close watch on how you live. You know, I would say that a, a very large portion of our lives are just lived in autopilot. We don't think much about it. I mean, just think about how many times you drive from point A to point B, your work to your house, and you get to work or you get to your house and you go, I don't remember anything of the last 20 minutes. Scary. People are all worried about self-driving cars. I guarantee you, most of the cars on the freeway are <laughs> autonomous. <laughs> They're already driving by themselves. And, and so, so much of our lives is lived in autopilot. And this is a really good exhortation. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. Now you may say, well, yeah, I'm living a life, but I'm not teaching. Point number five. Remember, your life is teaching others how to live and walk with Christ. And this is a sobering reality. I'm convinced after now almost 20 years of teaching the Bible, more has been taught for good or for bad by my life than by my words. And our lives are teaching every single day. There are people who watch you that may never come to this building, come to this church, or hear a Bible study here. There are people watching you in your neighborhood, in your home, at work, at school, out in the community, and your life is teaching someone. Our lives are teaching others how to live and walk with Jesus. What is our life saying? Keep close watch on how you live, on your teaching. It is my hope, it is my desire for myself and for this church that our lives would be exemplary, that we would be an example to Christians and to non-Christians in our exercise of the word, of love, of faith, of the spirit, of all of these things that people would see our lives working out the saving power of Christ in us. But for that to take place, at the very least, we need to be aware of the fact that our lives are teaching something. And with that sobering reality, I think we probably need to pray and ask God to help us. Amen? Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? Father, I thank you for the promise of the scriptures that though we can do nothing in and of ourselves, we can do all things through you who gives us strength. Lord, I am not sufficient of myself to think anything as being of myself, but my sufficiency is from you, and it is you who enables me to be a good servant of the gospel. Lord, 
We just come before you once again and admit that reality. Our inability, apart from your strength and power at work in us, to work these things out. But Lord, in admitting that inability, we pray, God, that you would work in us to will and to do your good pleasure this week. By your spirit, would you enable us to walk these things out, but not just to walk these things out. Lord, would you, by your spirit, Holy Spirit, would you quicken us to remember to walk these things out? When we are frustrated, when we are tempted to be impatient, when we are tempted to be upset or irritable, would you, by the quickening grace of your Holy Spirit, remind us to walk in humility and patience and goodness and self-control by your grace, by your power at work in us, Lord, we pray that you'd give us your patience and your self-control. And so that the people who know us would see you at work in us. And they would have to admit, that's not you, but that's Christ in you. God, do that work in us, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name.